Hello everyone! This week I am giving a presentation to a local office of the United States Immigration and Citizenship Services, and I want to do a trial run with y'all to partly share the information I want to talk about, partly to practice getting ready to step into this space sharing some of these messages. I can tell I'm out of practice with public speaking live because I've been doing some dry run rehearsals and my throat is like, oh, why are you talking so much so loudly in your teacher authoritarian voice? I also have some tea that is still too hot to drink. So when I was first invited to come speak on the theme of mental health, I had to do some thinking and reflection about what that looked like for me. The area of mental health that I'm really called towards and that my professional experiences align with as well is more of the macro perspective of mental health, which is looking at how does society as a whole either help or hurt our sense of mental health. I myself have gone through some major shifts in my paradigm along this journey of learning, and that's part of what I want to share. That's part of the journey that I want to share with you all here today. Hence, the name of my presentation is Humanizing Humans, a Trauma-Informed Paradigm Shift. I want to talk about how these bigger systems and structures ripple out and influence our experience, our trauma, what that means for who we are in the world. So by way of introductions, we have a short amount of time here, so I'm just going to kind of throw my resume up on the screen, up on the board here. You can get a sense that my professional journey indeed has been more focused on the macro track. Research, data, statistics, advocacy, social change, institutional oppression is a class that I love teaching. It's a class that I still teach. Most recently, I've been on a journey of travel and community exploration. That could be a whole other presentation topic for a whole other day. The point of all of this is just that I have had the benefit of being able to look at the human condition and step into and experience aspects of the human condition in a lot of different capacities, ranging from some of that direct service, working directly with people who are in the foster care system, all the way up to the teaching experience, all the way up to venturing out into other community spaces and experiencing what it's like to step into a culture that's very different from my own. Something that I have found to be true along my journeys and that has continued to kind of lead and feed, especially this next this chapter that I'm in right now of travel and community exploration is this understanding of the impact of trauma and really how all human suffering, most of the challenges that we experience as humans, I continued to find that all roads lead back to trauma. I continued to find that whatever space I was entering, whether it be a social justice space, an educational space, something in child welfare, something in a community setting, that we're all chasing the same things. We're all chasing connection, we're all chasing understanding. We're all chasing a sense of belonging. Of course, we have more needs than just those, but by and large, this is the pattern that I began to notice through my explorations. Okay, so I wanna do a little temperature check before we dive fully into the content I wanna share with you today. And I also just wanna contextualize all of this and, and really encourage us to move away from any kind of feeling like judgment or shame or guilt or, you know, I should have known or I should have been doing something differently. The, the stuff that we're going to be talking about today with trauma and institutionalized oppression is, is really innovative. I see, us on, I see us in the process of a broader mental health revolution as a society. So a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about today are, are sort of like just coming up in our, in our social and our conscious awareness in this culture, in this country. So no, no judgment, no beating yourselves up if you didn't know. This is a conversation that I see happening right now, and, and that's part of why I'm really excited to bring it all to you. Okay, so I will invite you to raise your hand if you regularly think about the role that trauma plays for the people that you encounter in your work. And obviously, if you're watching this online, you can raise your hand or not raise your hand. <laughs> All right, the second invitation here, I invite you to raise your hand if you regularly think about the role that trauma plays for you and your work, how trauma influences you, how it impacts and shows up within your experiences. Well, regardless of whether or not you raised your hand, I believe that there will be something new for you in this presentation today. If you're already thinking about these things, great. If you aren't yet thinking about these things, maybe some of this content will, will help you just reflect a little bit more. So. My whole topic presentation is about this paradigm shift of trauma. What I mean, what do I mean by shifting our paradigm of trauma? What is this aha moment? Ultimately, it's this in a nutshell. It's an understanding that society is traumatizing. We're going to break this down a little bit. 
Okay, so first of all, I want to use a comparison to the medical model of disability compared to the social model of disability. These are two separate paradigms. These are two different ways of viewing the experience of disability. And disability is a good example that I want to use here because it really highlights the differences in paradigms that can come from looking at a, at a particular experience or situation from the outside in versus looking at it from the inside out. So a medical model of disability looks at the problem as being the individual. The individual is the problem. Disability is caused by impairment. That impairment is within the person. That's what needs to change. A social model of disability flips that paradigm. A social model of disability has us paying attention to the barriers that exist in society and, and indicates that that is what is creating disability. The problem is not the individual. The problem is, is that we've created a society that has differential access for different people. We've created a society that doesn't allow access for certain groups of people. So I'm a very visual learner. I'm a very visual thinker. I'm going to throw up a lot of visual examples on the, board, on the screen today. Here's another way of thinking about this medical model understanding of disability. This person's legs don't work properly. They can't use the stairs. They need medication. They need some sort of accessibility, special needs. Social model of disability, again, is paying attention to the barriers in society, the physical and environmental barriers, the organizational and institutional barriers, even things like communication style, even things like attitudes that we have. Again, the point being here that the emphasis, the emphasis is on the barriers within society that are disabling. It's those barriers that are disabling. It's not the person. So this is the sort of lens that I want us to practice applying towards trauma, to view society as what is traumatizing, not an individual person's fault. We have a broader societal issue where trauma exists. So this is a really complicated slide that, again, could be a, a whole separate 30 minute talk in and of itself. Uh, but this is what the slide is illustrating. The slide is illustrating the reasons why society is traumatizing. There are these social structures, this flow chart, this is essentially a flow chart that's showing us how these social structures that were institutionalized in this country before any of us were even a spark of anything in the, on the world. It's showing us how these societal structures create the conditions that lead to trauma. You can see how that flow chart sort of circles around and all those arrows end up pointing at trauma. And there might be words on here that are confusing or you're not quite sure what they mean. That is totally okay. The ultimate emphasis here is just on these societal structures, these conditions as leading to trauma. And ultimately trauma is what leads to inflammation in the body. This image is actually created by a physician, Dr. Rupa Maria, um, who co-authored co this book that was published, I believe this year, Inflamed Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. Really hefty read, heavy read, very impactful read that breaks down the ways that these mechanisms show up in our health industry in, in this country. So the point of that flowchart, the message of all of this is that we all experience trauma. Trauma is everywhere. Trauma is part of the human experience. The way that we've designed our society right now, inherently traumatizing. And you know, that's like a normal part of life. A normal part of life is to move through trauma. This just isn't always something that we're conscious of in this day and age. So let's talk about what is trauma? How do we actually define trauma? Here's a little quote from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration that talks about what is trauma. Trauma results from an event, a series of events, or set of ex a set of circumstances that is experienced as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Now that is a broad definition of trauma, right? That can include a lot of different experiences and it's very individualized about what's going to impact and cause impairment for a person. I find that when, when we talk about trauma in this country, in this culture, very often people are thinking of these huge horrific experiences. So these items in the gray column here, car accidents, natural disasters, racism. We don't often think about the examples, the experiences that are in this more green shaded column, the also trauma column as being trauma. Conditional love, silent treatment, keeping family secrets, especially when that's part of our growing up, especially when that's part of our childhood experience, that really affects how we continue to move in the world as even through adulthood, even into and through adulthood. 
some people talk about this as big T trauma versus little t trauma. Big T trauma, again, are the things that we tend to think of and point to as trauma. Being in a war, being assaulted. The little t trauma is stuff that we might not think. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily impact as much as the big T trauma, but it still has an impact. Going through a breakup, experiencing bullying, being harassed or publicly shamed. This cute little image adds a pandemic to the conversation. Surviving a pandemic is traumatic. Here are a few more things that came to my mind when I was thinking about this. Ancestral shame, social rejection, not being able to be our authentic selves, again, especially as we're growing up. There's also layers and levels of indirect trauma, the type of trauma that we can experience through coming into contact with other people's trauma. Especially in the social work profession, this is something that we have to think about a lot because very often we are walking through someone's intense trauma experience and that comes into our system, our brains and our bodies as well. All of this to say, we need a much broader umbrella, we need a much wider umbrella when we talk about trauma of understanding what trauma actually is. Trauma is all of us. If I asked you to raise your hand, if you see yourself somewhere on this slide, I imagine all of us would be raising our hands. Again, the particular type of trauma that I'm really interested in and that is really compelling to me to talk about and explore is the trauma that comes from difference. Here we're seeing this like social model twist on the idea of trauma, on the idea of being different, being othered. Being different is not the problem. Being treated differently is. That same medical model versus social model twist. We see this play out in what is sometimes called the isms. That's how I teach it in my institutional oppression class. All these different ways that we can experience discrimination based on our age, our faith, our ability status, our sex, our sexuality, etc. Here's a really good way to think about it as well, this wheel of power and privilege. If you see on the outer edge, there are all these different categories that each and every one of us fit somewhere in those categories. Each and every one of us have a housing status, have a body size, have an experience with our mental health. What this wheel is showing is those who are towards the center of the wheel, closer to sources of power, closer to having power, closer to privilege. On the outer edge of the wheel, we see the more marginalized experiences, the people who are gonna have less access to power and privilege just by nature of the identity that they happen to be born with. So for example, wealth. Wealth is often something we're born with. Sometimes it's something that can be generated. Very often it's something that, that we're born into. We can see that people who are rich, people who are wealthy, are gonna be closer to that power center. More access to power, more access to resources, more access to the privilege of that identity. People who are less wealthy, people who are living in poverty, are gonna find themselves on the outer edges. That's a more marginalized experience. That's where discrimination, that's where oppression comes into play. So we each can categorize ourselves in each of these different areas in terms of whether it's an identity that gives us more power or gives us more of the marginalized experience. Intersectionality is a term that we use to talk about how all of these different aspects of our identity and our specific relationship to power and marginalization within that identity, how all of that intersects, interacts, sort of like blends together and becomes a unique milkshake of who we are as a person and what our experience in the world is going to be. Kimberly Crenshaw is the one who coined the term intersectionality. She says, intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it locks and intersects. It is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and privilege. So as mentioned, I'm a visual learner. Let's visualize how this shakes out in reality. So if I am somebody who's walking through the world with the marginalized experience of poverty, it is like a boulder is hanging on my back. It is like extra weight that is weighing me down. You know, it's hard enough to move through the day-to-day -day life of being a human in the society sometimes. Having one of these marginalized identities is like a boulder that we have to carry at the same time. So you see this poor little stick guy is trying to make his way up the stairs. The fact that he's simultaneously having to shoulder this, this marginalized experience of poverty makes that journey even more cumbersome, makes that journey even more difficult, even more taxing. This is where trauma and inflammation in the body come into play because it is a constant stressor. This person is walking throughout their days worrying about, am I going to have food to feed my children? Am I going to be able to pay rent this month? Am I going to end up houseless? These are really heavy concerns to be carrying on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis.
Now, if we add some complexity to this little stick guy's figure, let's say he immigrated here from another country. So he's a person of color. He also immigrated, so he doesn't have much of a support system here yet. Maybe he has a learning disability. Maybe he doesn't read very well. English is not his first language, so he's also not fully fluent in English. All of these are marginalized experiences that come with less access to power and privilege and increased experiences of discrimination and marginalization. And it's cumulative, right? That's what this image here is pointing to. Like now, in addition to the poverty boulder, he's carrying the boulder of racism, lack of support system, the learning disability. He's carrying all of these boulders, again, making his movement through the day-to-day -day experience of just trying to survive as a human so much more difficult than if he was closer to that center of having power and privilege. So you might be seeing and noticing that this ends up creating sort of a cyclical relationship, a reinforcing cycle between trauma and disadvantage. Because the more cumulative trauma somebody has, the more cumulative disadvantage they're going to have, the more cumulative disadvantage someone has, the more trauma they're likely to be experiencing as a result of those marginalized identities. So it becomes this like chicken or the egg sort of scenario where it's hard to tell if trauma came first or if the disadvantage came first because they end up reinforcing one another in a cycle. So let's apply this in a way that's relevant for this particular presentation. Immigrants who have money, who have social capital, who have more privileged identities. So those immigrants who find themselves more within that center of the power and privilege wheel who are closer to, to power and privilege within their many identities, they're also more likely to have access to a private attorney, culturally appropriate communication skills, interviewing skills, etc. On the other end of that, immigra immigrants who have fewer resources and fewer privileged identities, immigrants who find themselves on the outer wheel of that circle, less likely to have access to those same resources they need, private attorney, communication, interviewing skills, so those folks need that access more. They need the support that comes from an attorney. They need to be able to develop, develop those skills even more because of their marginalized identities, yet also because of their margin, marginalized identities, they're less likely to be able to access what they need. So in addition to this idea that we all experience trauma, it's part of all of our journeys in one way or the other, even if it might be differential from one person to the next, we all also develop adaptive responses to trauma and we all make judgments about other people's responses to trauma too. We're not going to go into this in this presentation because again, that's a whole separate one. But there's so much new and amazing information coming up in society right now about how trauma influences our brain and body. Trauma literally rewires our brain and, and shifts our body into new states of being. It's healable. We can undo that, but we have to have power access resources to be able to do the healing work. So for a lot of us, this becomes a lifelong experience. You've probably heard of the four trauma responses. These are the most common types of trauma responses that have been categorized in this culture. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I think this image is interesting because it shows how those trauma responses can come up in our communication patterns when we're activated, when you know we're upset at our partner or we're overly stressed about our job or maybe something triggers a previous trauma memory for us. We tend to slip into these communication responses that align with those four different types of trauma responses. So fight can look like interrupting, controlling behaviors, lack of listening. Flight can look like avoidance, perfectionism, putting things off. Freeze can look like feeling stuck, feeling numb, dissociating. Fawn, no boundaries, saying yes to everything, codependency. I bet if I ask people to raise their hands, if you see yourself somewhere on the screen, again, most of us would raise our hands. I know I see myself in a few of those different categories, depending on the situation, depending on my emotional response. Again, we all have these types of adaptive responses. Now, the challenge here is how do we move away from having judgments about those adaptive responses? How do we shift our paradigms so we're not focused on these green words on the outer edges here? That's very often where we're focused when we talk about trauma, where we're looking at the fact that somebody has a substance abuse issue and saying like, wow, you're an addict, you need treatment, you got to deal with this, this is your fault. There's a balance between accountability and understanding that trauma is actually what's happening here. So part of this 
social model twist towards trauma is, is shifting our paradigm from what's wrong with you? Why are you this way? Why are you depressed? Why do you have an eating disorder? Why do you have these self-destructive behaviors into what happened to you? Understanding that trauma is actually the root of what those issues are. So in our clients, this can show up in a lot of different ways. Struggles with memory in particular, lack of chronology, hazy details, difficulties with processing, organizing information, focus and concentration, being emotionally reactive, a fear of authority, struggles with eye contact or fidgety behavior, low resiliency to stressful situations, such as an immigration interview is going to be a very stressful situation. That's a real high pressure experience to dictate whether somebody can even feel safe in the physical environment that they're in. There can also be in, inappropriate or incongruent emotional displays, too much or too little of something. For example, I worked for Project Harmony, a child advocacy center in Omaha for a while. And something, one of the reasons why Project Harmony came into being was a realization earlier on in the child welfare field that people had a hard time believing children when they talked about their traumatic stories. Sometimes children, when they've been through something horrific, report it back with a flat affect this emotional incongruency piece. So when children would be telling a judge or a caseworker or a lawyer this really horrific thing that happened to them and just kind of casually talking about it, just like they went to the grocery store yesterday and then like this happened and this happened. Sometimes the adults thought that meant that the child was lying. The child wasn't lying, it was a trauma response. So part of the reason the Child Advocacy Center now exists is to make sure that there's a trauma-informed interview process for children that can help them talk about what they went through without casting that sort of judgment upon them. There's a compounding factor in this situation as well, the role of culture, which encompasses all of these different things, the way people think, their manners of interacting, expected behaviors, values, etc. I consulted some articles for this presentation because <clears throat> I am a bit of a research nerd. One of the articles talked about how trauma can be experienced and expressed differently across cultures, which can influence how individuals come across in interviews, what they remember, what they disclose, recipe for misunderstanding and miscommunication. So some of the examples of how this shows up in some cultures, less descriptions, more discrepancies, tendency to agree, say what they think the interviewer wants to hear. Again, there can be a desire to agree with the person, an authority that might outweigh the desire to provide an accurate description. There might be an emphasis on politeness and proper manners that can limit the amount of information that they're disclosing. There's a lot going on. <laughs> so let's talk about like how in actuality can we start to shift some of this stuff. And I specifically want to talk about empathy as a superpower because to me, empathy is the antidote for all of this. Empathy is about understanding somebody else's experience. And there are these four pieces that I thought of when I was thinking about how empathy plays a role. They're very interconnected and overlapping. We're going to go through each of them pretty quickly because, um, again, they all really kind of build on one another. And the first is getting curious, recognizing that we all have reasons for the ways that we are. I talk about this as hurt people hurt people in my teaching. People don't hurt people for no reason. There's always some trauma. There's always some personal pain at the root of it. Not that that excuses or condones it. Not that that makes it acceptable, but there's always a reason behind it. I like to think about this in the context of a tree, how a tree grows. We tend to think of the top part of the tree as what the tree is. Similarly with people, we think the outer shell, the version of them that we see is what they are, when in fact, the most important part of the tree is under the surface. And we know that those root systems had to grow first in order for the top part of that tree to, to be able to grow itself. People are very similar. The stuff we see at the surface, actions, beliefs, lifestyles, etc. there's always something underlying, underlying underneath. There's always reasons behind the way that we are, whether it was because of how we were born or whether it's because of how we were nurtured growing up. Some people think about this as an iceberg as well. The stuff that we see on the surface with people is such a small, tiny, inaccurate representation of the depth of who they actually are under the surface. Next item here, perspective is subjective and cultural. There are multiple valid ways to view the same situation. So the ways that we perceive others in the world around us, I like to talk about this as being shaped by our fishbowl realities. Just like a goldfish in a fishbowl thinks that that is the world, doesn't have a concept that there's something that exists outside of the bowl, 
we too can get into that way of thinking when we're just moving about our day-to-day -day life. We're getting up, we're going to work, we're hanging out with our family, we're seeing our friends. When our environment is the same almost every single day, we fall into that same fishbowl experience where we're almost unable to see that there's things, there's other experiences, there's other ways of being and believing beyond that fishbowl. Our family of origin shapes this, the community we grew up in, our broader country's culture, our exposure or lack thereof to diverse populations, similarly with diverse experiences. If you've ever had the experience of moving to another country or living in a place where the culture was drastically different than your own, you've probably had some of those moments of like breaking out of the fishbowl and realizing like, huh, there are totally different ways of being and viewing humanity, viewing what it means to be a human than I originally thought. Next, question what you know. I love this image. The most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. If we're doing things just because we've always done them that way, then it is very likely we are falling victim to our fishbowls. It is very likely that we are just replicating something that is, is really narrow and not expanded. And finally, there are common threads of the human experience. What this means is that empathy is always possible. All human emotions share common roots. I might not be able to identify, I might not be able to identify with the exact experience that you went through, but I can find a feeling in me, something that I've experienced that matches the feeling in you, and I can connect to empathy through that lens. Now, I like this image too. People think that empathy is feeling sorry for somebody. That's not what empathy is. Empathy is about understanding. What are people feeling? What are someone's emotions? What are they thinking? How can I really listen to what they have to say? I love this quote too. Empathy is about finding echoes of another person in yourself. And I also want to mention, this does not require approval. This does not require agreement. This does not require any kind of gullibility. We can hold multiple realities. I talk about this in my teaching too. We can hold multiple realities. We can have empathy for somebody and also understand that that doesn't condone or excuse their behavior. We can have both accountability and responsibility and empathy. Okay, so some final takeaways as I wrap this up. This is all stuff that we've covered so far. I just kind of wanted to encapsulate it and um, add a few more quotes from some of the literature sources that I reviewed. First and foremost, consider trauma. A trauma-informed response emphasizes the importance of understanding how traumatic experiences impact the individuals involved. So once again, we can have a general rule of thumb in assuming that all the people who walk through our doors have trauma because all people have trauma and especially those who are coming through our doors, they're gonna have some increased experiences of marginalization, they're gonna have some increased experiences of trauma. So in practice, that can look like some reflection on how are we engaging with people? How might I approach somebody who's experienced domestic violence or sexual assault? How would I approach them in tone? What kind of facial expression would I use? How would I build rapport with them? Similarly, if who I was interacting with was a loved one of someone that I knew, would I pose my questions in a different way? Would I use a different tone of voice? These are things to think about and like how we're showing up with people. All of this is about seeing other people as human first and their second traits, their, their other traits as second. Their race, their class, their ability, their appearance, their trauma response patterns, all of that. Consider culture as the other piece here. Having an awareness that there's these cross-cultural differences, that trauma interacts with culture, that these negative life events are experienced and expressed differently per culture, how, influ how events are remembered and disclosed differ per culture, and that emotions are more accurately understood when we're judging people in the same national, ethnic, or regional group than we are. We're gonna be much more likely to misunderstand people if we're coming from different cultural experiences. So again, a rapport here is an opportunity for us. We can be as familiar as we can with customary greetings in other people's cultures. We can be aware in how we're connecting with people in the type of body language that we're using. We can have a cultural and trauma awareness for example, sometimes being too close to somebody can be difficult for different cultures or difficult for people with different trauma experiences. Same with eye contact. Sometimes too much eye contact can set off someone's trauma responses. There's also this, also this quote on training that I wanted to share from the same article. Training should address specific cultural assumptions that investigators may hold, including widespread beliefs that inconsistencies, vague descriptions, lack of emotionality, or certain nonverbal behaviors, such as gaze aversion, are indicative of deception. Again, this is particularly important when the interview is about something stressful and the interviewee is from a different cultural background. And finally, 
finally, finally, consider yourselves. Because we really can't humanize other people unless we can first humanize ourselves. Being aware of the role that trauma plays in our lives, including compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, those types of indirect traumas that are likely to come from working with people who are going through a stressful traumatic situation. We're going to be much more at risk for things like burnout. Okay, so the final piece that I want to leave with you, this is actually a slide from a presentation that I've done for uh, my graduate level course on self-care practices. This is, again, very important when we're talking about social work. There's a difference between the types of self-care self -care practices that help us cope, that take us out of our bodies, that are more external focused, that are more about distraction and numbing and avoidance, compared to self-care practices that help us heal, which are practices that help us get deeper into our body, help us develop internal awareness, enhance that mind-body connection, develop heart, co heart coherence, etc. So are we mindful of how we feel? Are we mindful of the practices and the ways that we're responding to how we feel? All of these things are ways that we can better consider ourselves in this work. All right, that is all I have. Thank you for listening. These are some of the, the resources that I consulted when I was thinking about what to bring to y'all today. Thanks for letting me do a dry run. That is my presentation. Maybe you learned something too. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Wish me luck. Mm-hmm. <laughs>